about the people that are joining us today. So we have Emily, she's the PM behind Fig Jam. We also have Kelsey, um, she's the PM that works with the prototyping team. Versabelle, she focuses on the platform side. And then last but not least, we have Yuki, who is our VP of product here at Figma. Cool. So the main topics that we're covering today. So we'll start off with Kelsey talking about, you know, how her team uses FigJam to brainstorm. Um, followed up with Versabelle, who'll be discussing on how to use FigJam for daily standups. And then Yuki is going to talk about using FigJam for quarterly planning. And then um, we will have Emily talking about using FigJam for creating product roadmaps. All right, so before we actually dive into the details of them sharing how their team uses FigJam, as well as the templates that they're utilizing today, um, I think it'd be good to set a bit of context. So I'd like to invite Emily and Yuki to kind of start us off with a bit of context. Um, Emily, why don't you tell us a bit about, you know, what exactly is FigJam? Hi, everyone. Uh, so FigJam is Figma's brand new online whiteboard where teams can ID it together. I'll quickly share my screen so I can give a quick demo so everyone knows what I'm talking about. And so your FigJam files live side by side with your Figma files, so all of your thoughts can be found in one place. Uh, you can tell the difference be because the FigJam files will have this purple marker icon and your Figma files will have this blue pen icon. Uh, creating a new FigJam file is really easy once you're in Figma. You just look to the top right, look for the new button, and when you click on it, you can choose between a design file and a FigJam file, and it's as easy as that. I'll jump right into an example to showcase a few of the really common ways that we use FigJam, although all of the panelists here today will go into a lot of depth. Uh, so you can use it for brainstorming, where participants can just drag a sticky note from the bottom. It's really easy for anyone to contribute ideas. Uh, you can also use FigJam for diagramming out user flows or processes that you have in your mind. Um, you can drag out shapes and connect them and create different shapes. Uh, and the great thing about it is that when you move things around, everything stays connected, so you don't have to spend a lot of time manually moving different arrows and shapes. Uh, and you can even use FigJam for playing. And so something that we like to do a lot as a team is we'll choose a prompt like, I don't know, unicorn, and then choose a medium like shapes or markers. And then you have like 30 seconds to try and make that animal out of shapes or markers or more. And so that's Big Jam in a nutshell. Uh, back to you, Anna. And I think you might be muted. I have too many windows open at the same time. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the brief um, summary, Emily. And yeah, Yuki, why don't you tell us a bit about, you know, how exactly the team started building Big Jam? Yeah, um, I think a few things. Um, one is, you know, as a company, what we're trying to do is make it really easy for people to uh, take an idea from completion or from conception all the way to completion. So from the brainstorm phase all the way to getting it built. Uh, Figma design has been one piece of that, but one of the things that we realized is that there's a step before people even come into Figma where people are ideating ideas, synthesizing research findings, uh, thinking about what's next. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we could provide value there and provide value for anyone and uh, not just designers. Um, we also realized that a lot of people were beginning to use and stretch Figma in that way, um, especially during the pandemic. And so we started to see teams use Figma for brainstorming, but it was still a little bit hard for you know, PMs and engineers and other non-designers to kind of come in. And so what we decided to do is build a dedicated product. Um, hopefully it will feel more accessible. It's more connected with Figma so that you can seamlessly take some of those ideas and translate them into designs. Um, and that's how we've been thinking about FigGen. Great, right. thank you so much for that, Yuki. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, I think it'd be great to actually start diving into the specific ways that our team uses FigJam. Um, also, someone will be dropping into the chat a file that you guys can duplicate, and it's basically gonna contain all the different templates that our team will be going through um, as they're demonstrating you know, all the different ways that they've utilized FigJam. So yeah, let's move on to Kelsey to talk a bit about brainstorming. 
everyone. I'm just gonna get set up and share my screen real quick. All right, cool. So I am going to share a bit about how um, we use FigJam to run cross-functional brainstorms. And then after that, how we, um, a few different exercises we use to get alignment and whittle down, um, whittle down ideas. And so early on in the product life cycle, um, you want to be open to any and all ideas. So FigJam is an incredible tool for brainstorming. Um, a good brainstorm, I would say, is very collaborative. Um, so you should make sure to include your entire team. Um, it's also open to all possibilities. So kind of similar to a concept in um, improv, um, you want to create a yes and environment. Uh, and it's also very generative. So generally in brainstorms, you'll go for quantity over quality. Um, there are tons of ways to run brainstorms in Figma, and one of them is literally just using the timer feature up here, setting a timer, um, and then having people, giving people a prompt and having them start to use post-it notes. Um, and so you can say, for 10 minutes, everyone come up with ideas answering this prompt, just put sticky notes everywhere, and then afterwards you could spend a few minutes um, organizing them, kind of clustering them by different themes, and then voting on the things that you think are worth following up on. Um, another way to do it is, this is not my template, but uh, if you want a little bit more structure, you could try something like Crazy Eggs. Um, and this is an activity where you and your team get eight minutes to come up with eight ideas for solving a problem. And the goal here is to be fast in setting, uh, getting your ideas out with work, without worrying too much about the details. And then at the end of that eight minutes, um, you can share your ideas and discuss the ones that are worth exploring. But I actually want to talk a little bit about what you do after a brainstorm. Um, so now you've got a ton of really great ideas, and maybe you've even highlighted some that are worth investigating. But now it's time to start whittling them down. And so one format I like to use is um, a buy a feature exercise. And here, um, this is an exercise that allows you to get feedback from your entire team on prioritization. And this is one of my favorite prioritization exercises because you also get a sense of weight or how people, um, how much people would invest in an area, not just um, a stack rank list. Um, and so I'll walk through this template, it's pretty fun. Um, and these will be published or published now actually, so I'll share the links to them. Um, but in this exercise, um, usually I start by saying everybody gets a certain dollar amount and maybe I'll just make up what that number is. Um, and then I ask everyone to um, create that dollar amount with or create that amount with whatever bills they want. Um, and so here, oops, I need to get my toolbar back. Um, just have everyone use the stamp feature to create their bills. And so here, just as a reminder, if you hold down, um, the stamps get bigger. And then you can grab both of these if you want and hit Command G or click that group button. And that makes it easier to drag them together. And then for this exercise, I actually just created a bunch of money for people below here. So everybody in this file has some money to spend. Um, you can either just do buy a feature, but Sometimes I like to do by a focus area. And so here, sometimes I'll create these kind of presentations before that say, here's a potential focus area. We can double down on performance, a hypothesis about how this would you know, impact our business, a description and maybe some example features. Um, and then you can see people starting to put money where they think we should invest. Uh, and then another nice thing is if people also um, add comments on why. So if I think we should go all in on meme generation, maybe I explain why with a little post-it note here. Um, and this is helpful because again, you get a sense of like, not just, I think we should do, this is the most important and then this is the next most important thing, um, but you also get a sense of how much people spend. So after we go through this, um, I, I also always set a timer for this. So we have like 10 minutes to go through, spend your money, leave some comments. And then afterwards, um, we'll tally up how much money so this has $23, etc. And then as a group, go through all of the different post it notes and discuss like, hey, we're, we want to spend this much money here and read through some of the comments as a group and ask people to um, explain why they spent so much money or no money in, in the various sections. 
Uh, so this is a fun exercise to get alignment, especially with your team on how to prioritize different investment areas or specific features. Uh, and I wanted to share one more exercise that I like to do. Um, so imagine after this, maybe you have alignment with your team on what you think the best path forward is, but now you wanna make sure that you're aligned with leadership. Uh, so to do that, I often create a presentation um, to walk through, uh, uh, walk through the roadmap or make a new case for direction. Um, and then I use this thing called the alignment scale to get a sense of whether or not we are all aligned. So this is the template here that is also published to community, but I like to use these little spectrums here and you can come in and delete ones that you don't wanna use. You can change the colors if you wanna copy and paste them into Figma and change the colors, but you can also change the text here if you want to say something different. Um, and so here's another example of a way that I've used this. So. Um, maybe in the last exercise, we all thought we should all go in on um, interior design as our next big use case for Figma, which I personally would be very excited about. Um, and so maybe I have this whole presentation here that's like everybody's doing it and some ideas of um, you know, what the product could look like. These are actually just my own diagrams from my own home renovation. <laughs> um, but I give this presentation and say, here's the direction I think we should go in. Um, and then afterwards, I find that sometimes when you're giving these presentations, it's really hard to read the room. Um, maybe someone raised their hand and asked a question, but you're not sure, is that just out of curiosity? Was my answer sufficient? Do they actually have a genuine concern that I need to follow up on? And so it's actually really helpful, I find, to just have these statements after um, and then have people put their faces on the spectrum um, in response to all of those statements. Um, so here, I strongly agree that we should invest here. I'm always like pretty sold on it. And then um, again, I always like to have these sticky notes that people um, add for additional context underneath it. And then a nice thing, again, like I'd always use a timer for this, maybe just a few minutes for people to, to respond. Um, and then especially if it's a larger group, you might not have time to go through and read everybody's comments together. And so if you're a bit tight on time, another thing I like to do is spend a couple minutes where everyone reads each other's feedback and then you use this dot stamp to vote on the things that you want to discuss live. And that just whittles it down to things that pe it, like, people want to actually discuss as a group versus just statements that they wanted to share. Cool. Oh, so those are two, um, two exercises I really like doing after the brainstorm um, phase to get alignment, um, whether it's with your team or uh, with leadership. And so now I will send it back to Anna. Right. Thank you so much for that, Kelsey. Um, just as a reminder, again, um, for people joining in, please ask questions within the Q&A so that we can either answer those um, through responding back to you or we will be answering them live at the end of the live stream. Um, yeah, and that was super great. I felt like it was a really creative use of the face stamps in terms of voting on the different brainstorming ideas, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, going into first of all, uh, we'll be talking about how to use Vic Jam for standups. Cool. Um, I will share my screen. Um, cool. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about um, standups and the ways in which uh, I've used Vic Jam at Figma for different types of standups. Um, so in general, um, standups are helpful for getting context on what your teams are working on and just general knowledge sharing um, with everyone that you're working with. Also found standups to be helpful for providing accountability for your work, so stating what you plan to do and then following up on whether you've actually done something. Um, and then uh, lastly, but definitely not least, is asking for help and resolving blockers and issues. So it's a great format for just calling out when you need some help from um, other folks on your team. Um, and at Figma specifically, I've used two different types of standups. Uh, so one is daily and another is weekly. Um, I found that daily standups are most helpful for uh, when you're working with engineering teams or on projects where you need to coordinate and iterate on work really quickly and collaboratively. Um, you really need this sort of like daily feedback loops to help get unblocked on projects. Um, and again, I typically use these with uh, engineering teams. And then the weekly format is more helpful when um, really you're just focused on providing status updates that are less timely, doing things like educational deep dives, or just 
generally anything that doesn't require um, time sensitive iteration. So I use this format with uh, the other PMs at Figma on the product team. Um, so before FigJam, uh, we did uh, our daily standups over Zoom, um, but found these weren't great for a few reasons. The first is that engagement was pretty low. So when you have like a large Zoom meeting, um, it really was hard to keep everyone engaged when everyone was talking. Um, and it was also really hard to give kudos and response, respond to updates in a timely manner with, with the large meeting. There was a lot of just sort of I wasn't sure when to like go in and like provide feedback or comments, et cetera. Um, and then we didn't have written artifacts or notes of the updates or rich discussions that we had. Um, so th those are some of the problems that we we're hoping to solve with the tool like FigJam. Um, and then with our uh, weekly PM standups, we used Zoom in addition to PaperDoc. Um, but even though we had this sort of like written artifact, we found that these still weren't great for a few reasons. Um, so one, it, it wasn't conducive to keeping updates concise. So it's really easy to over-index on too much text not a ton of visuals, um, which was hard to process really quickly in a meeting and then also react to. Um, we also found that like a vertical format um, in terms of like a long form document um, made things difficult to track um, when, when there are a lot of updates. Um, and then it wasn't super easy to provide feedback, comments, or questions in line without everything feeling really overwhelming and hard to follow. Um, so now I'm going to jump into a couple of uh, examples of uh, templates that are both on community uh, for the different types of stand-up. So the first is a uh, daily stand-up that I use with my engineering team. Um, and as you can see, we have different columns for what folks did yesterday, today, uh, and blockers. Um, and I have locked these sections, which I find helpful if you are trying to um, put like stickies or other content within another grouping. Um, that way these don't get moved around as folks add their own um, stickies to the, the different sections. Um, so the way that we use this template is everyone jumps into the FigJam file uh, for the day and then we start adding um, stickies for uh, what we did yesterday, what we plan on doing today, and then calling out any blockers that we may have. Um, and as we're doing this, we also have a lot of fun with decorating the date. Um, again, this is just like a way to keep our standups fun, um, which we were really missing before we had a format like FigJam. Um, I think this week we were talking about the documentary My Octopus Teacher, uh, which is why we sort of got fun and like drew an octopus here. Um, but so once everyone has uh, sort of, you know, dropped their stickies in, um, then we go around the room um, and everyone reads out their stickies. So, um, what we tried to do is keep a simple and uh, concise like order so it's always clear who has gone and who hasn't so something like going from left to right um, and when someone has gone they'll read all of their sickies um, before passing on to the next person um, and then as someone is going uh, other people on the team can react um, so they can plus one something um, add you know like fun stickers or stamps um, and even just like doodle um, on what the other person uh, Sticky says are their update. Um, and we found this was a really, really good way to keep everyone engaged with the conversation and, and what was going on because it gave them sort of like a tactical way to engage with the, with the content. Um, and again, this was like uh, provided a really easy and fun way to give kudos as we were sort of like going through our updates. Um, and then with things like blockers, someone could sort of like jump in and say like, hey, I can help, I can help with this, um, uh, which was great. Um, and then, and of course, we had uh, you know a sort of record for our standup, which is always which is always great, so that you can go back and sort of check notes in terms of what was discussed. And uh, this next example is the one we use for uh, as a PM team, which is a weekly meeting, which is a little bit different. But so the way that this works is that we have um, an agenda, and what we start with is um, updates from Yuki, our VP of product. Um, which is actually outside of sort of like the, the sticky context. Um, he shares updates in terms of like what he's hearing from the exec team, other things that we should sort of keep top of mind as we're doing our work. Um, and that's when we sort of like jump into the jam and go around the room. Um, and the prompts that we use uh, are a personal update. So, you know, what's something that's changed in your personal life recently or something you've been thinking about? Um, we like to start with this because it's a nice icebreaker and ha helps keep a uh, things sort of like fun and light and not always just like about work. Um, it lets us like know our colleagues sort of on a personal level. Um, and then the next one is something that you're worried or excited about. So this is a format forum for um, PMs to just share like what's something that's coming up where they're not really sure how it's gonna go. Maybe they wanna solicit sort of feedback from 
um, other folks on the team. Uh, really, it's like a low stakes way to just share out uh, sort of what's top of mind. Um, and then similarly, the sort of hard problem section uh, or prompt is another way to share out like what is something hard or interesting that we're thinking about. Um, and something that we like to do here is we use dot voting. So as everyone is talking, um, we can use like stickers and reactions to like react to different updates. Um, and then we also use uh, dots using the stamp wheel um, to vote on a hard problem we think is particularly interesting um, that might warrant like diving deeper into um, at a future meeting. And so we have a couple of slots on our agenda for just ad hoc discussion items. And so um, we use uh, this sort of like format to help fill that agenda. And so once someone has given all their updates and folks have reacted, they'll sort of pass on to the next person to go. Um, and then we'll sort of keep going around the room um, until everyone has gone. Um, as you can see, everyone has like slightly different styles um, and again, have you know reacted to the different content on the stickies using um, our, our stamps. So those are a couple of uh, templates that uh, I use at Fig Figma uh, for different types of stand-ups that I found uh, to be helpful for my teams. Cool, I'll pass it back to Anna. Okay, thank you for that, Versabel. Um, it was super fun seeing how your team uses all the different stickers for reacting to the different ideas. I really love that, and that's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, we also got a question when someone was asking about uh, where they can find templates for FigJam. So actually, if you go to Figma, dot com slash community. Um, that's where you'll see a bunch of different, you know, files and plugins and things that people have shared. But then within that, you'll probably you'll see a tag that says FigJam, and that's where you can find the FigJam specific templates if you want to go see um, all the different kinds of like workshops or brainstorms that other people out there have been using FigJam for. Uh, cool. So let's move on to Yuki, who'll be talking about how teams can do reflections together and quarterly planning. All right, thanks, Anna, and thanks everyone for the awesome templates so far. So uh, I actually want to talk about retros, and we do retros um, before we start planning, after we've gone through uh, some projects and uh, and periods of time. And I first just want to talk about what retros are. And you know, as many of you know, it's just really an intentional way to reflect back on a project or a period of time, and to identify what worked, what didn't, and what you may want to change for ne next time. And I think they're important because, you know, first, it's a good forcing function to recognize good work, um, but it's also one in which we allow people to air out some concerns or frustrations. And sometimes you just don't have this natural forum to express these sentiments, and you don't want people to feel like they really have to go out of their way to express uh, these kinds of opinions, or maybe they have this loose idea of what could be going better, but don't bother with it because they think people don't care. And I think it's important for PMs in particular to run this because PMs have a lot of choice around how projects are run and how the next project can be run differently. And they're really important if you work in a fast paced environment like Figma, where it's just really tempting to just move on to the next thing because that next thing is waiting for you without taking the time to reflect. And the thing is, you know, processes have to change. Companies can grow a lot and what worked a year ago may no longer be working. And it's really healthy to revisit this at a cadence. So, I, I had this my own experience with this where I felt really overwhelmed with all that's next and didn't really promote a culture reflection on my own PM team. And when Bursabel joined, uh, she actually helped us institute a process of reflecting every six weeks as a PM team to be able to check in and we'll show you a template of how we did that. So before going to some of the content, I just wanna talk a little bit about what makes a good retro. Um, and I think there's these three things. One is that everyone's voice is heard. And we actually think that you know retros in on a digital canvas really help with that, uh, where we have some you know silent time to put your own ideas. It's not the case that one singular voice dominates the room, um, but I think this is a really important uh, point that everyone has a chance to express their opinions. The second one is that the reflection is deep enough to extract meaningful insights. So you can kind of go through the motions of a retro, but if there aren't the right kind of prompts that are helping you think about a problem from multiple perspectives, um, then you might not actually yield insights that are really interesting or actionable or meaningful. And then lastly, action items are taken at the end of a retro. We wanna make sure that you know, retros actually result in change uh, as opposed to just something that we, uh, we do. So uh, I first wanna share a really classic template uh, that a lot of you may be familiar with, which is the start, stop, continue template. 
Um, and uh, this, this is really uh, successful, I think, because it forces you to think about a given problem from different perspectives. You know, the start is the things that, you know, ideas that you've had and wanted to try out, for example. And stop is the things that aren't working that you want to voice. Um, and I really like continue because it's this explicit acknowledgement that something is working and that you like it and you want to kind of let people know that. Um, and if you apply this framework to any project or topic, it's pretty collectively exhaustive in bringing all the different perspectives to the room. Um, so in terms of how we set it up, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, you have these three columns and like, first of all, I have uh, these things locked so that um, you know, people don't accidentally move them. You want to make sure that each of these columns are big enough so that a lot of post-its can be placed. Um, it, there are some options that you can uh, choose, like, for example, with a post that you can choose to show or hide the author in case, you know, you think maybe anonymity is better uh, or avoids bias, and that's totally up to you. And uh, basically what I do is I like to spend uh, time on each of these columns. So maybe say, hey, like, let's spend five minutes thinking about the things that we want to start and obviously use the timer feature here and get that going. And at the end of that, you know, take some time to react to each other's ideas, whether it's plus ones, hearts, all the things that you've seen so far, uh, make sure you cluster. I like to kind of create little headings as I see kind of clusters of, of themes emerge. Uh, so that it's easy to kind of synthesize, synthesize and read it after the fact. Um, so you know that's kind of uh, that's kind of how uh, how we run a retro. Maybe someone has kind of come in and there are things that you want to clarify, and it's also important for people to kind of have a chance to elaborate. And so you know uh, often maybe use something like observation mode if someone else is in the file uh, to kind of observe them and help uh, have them walk through some of their ideas as well. Um, so this is just one template, and as I was thinking about what to share, I realized that our community has a lot of great examples. So if you search uh, for retro in our Figma community, you'll see a bunch of different examples, both in Fig Jam and Figma before Fig Jam was a thing. Um, and so some favorites include things like this, um, similar to the start, uh, stop, continue framework. Uh, this is like a much more fun, cute version of that. Um, I also like this framework here, uh, which also starts to include things like appreciation um, or even kind of a reflection on previous action items. So it's kind of like a. Hi, can everyone hear me? Um, <laughs> I think UK may have frozen, but I just want to make sure. Okay, awesome. <laughs> okay, well, it's unfortunate that <laughs> Yuki got a little cut off there. Um, yeah, okay, great. Um, I think it'd be good, maybe if he's able to come back uh, once his Wi-Fi kind of gets figured out, um, he can finish talking more about um, how his team does the retros, but I think we can go ahead um, and move on to Emily, who will be talking about using FigJam for road mapping. So Emily, would you mind? Yeah, I can do a awkward transition into road mapping. <laughs> Hopefully he comes back. Uh, but hi, I'm Emily. And something I do like very frequently with FigJam is I use it to visualize roadmaps. And so let me share my screen so I can start walking everyone through. And so uh, you may have heard of a format called Gantt charts. Uh, Gantt charts are a way to show tasks and projects displayed against time. Um, and so most of the roadmaps that I visualize in FigJam are, are actually forms of Gantt charts. Uh, you can use it for different things like team level planning for you know, uh, entire engineering teams, or you can use it for project level planning for complicated projects where you have to align and coordinate across multiple work streams. And why I really like Gantt charts is that it's a really clear way to visually communicate your plans. When you're sharing plans in a bullet list or in a table, it's 
really easy for the size or the like various details of it to get kind of lost because everything is kind of displayed equally. Whereas in Gantt charts, you can actually see, you know, large projects take a big chunk of time and small projects are really tiny. Um, and uh, why do I like using FigGem in particular for it? Uh, so I think FigGem is a really easy way to kind of just move things around. So for example, I could just move this around, move these stickers around, and it helps me and the team be able to really quickly try out different variations of the roadmap in a really small amount of time, because you don't have to worry about messing with like tables or cells, or sometimes you have to like merge cells and it could get complicated quickly. And so uh, I'll, I'll jump right in and show an example of how I build out roadmaps. And so usually I do this collaboratively with uh, like the cross-functional leads, like the engineering manager, design lead, uh, and whoever else is relevant. Uh, and you can start with something like this, where you have some sort of timeline on the top. And so this is an example where it's set up for quarterly planning, but you can also put you know, six blocks for half a year or even 12 for a whole year. You can use whatever time scale you want. Um, and usually I use blocks like this to build out what each project looks like. And so you can have things like uh, project sizing that's small, medium, large. Um, this is actually something that coming into this is usually uh, pretty helpful to talk with your team about and have rough t-shirt sizing for you know, the candidate projects that you have for a period of time. Um, and so usually like my project blocks and my Gantt chart will have some combination of you know, the size of what it is, um, some tags that's helpful for us to understand as we're moving things around. So for example, this might be like a P0, like let's build a block in real time. So I have this medium project, um, let's say it's P0. Um, and something that we do really frequently at Figma is we also put down who's actually gonna be working on the project so that we have a sense of how to load balance. And if we actually have the engineers with the right skills on the right projects. And so one small tip here, as you can see, I have all of these uh, pictures, which are actually just variations of pictures of my cat Felix, uh, but you can get your engineer pictures in here really easily by clicking this uh, place image icon in the toolbar. Um, you can drop in an image uh, like this one I have of Felix. Uh, if you click on this crop icon and then choose the circle, you can actually get a circle really quickly that way and then resize it to match all of the other ones. Um, and so now that you have all the engineers in there, you can do things like, oh, this medium project is actually a really good fit for this cat and that cat. And you'll have a bunch of these project blocks. Um, and then here's the fun part where I actually call this Tetrising with my team because you're trying to make all of the blocks fit in the right amount of time. Uh, but usually we'll say, oh, like so-and-so is free mid-month. And so this project will have to start here. Um, and then you start orienting and arranging the blocks to figure out you know, who will be working on what project one. Uh, and then as we're building this out, it's actually really helpful because then we'll start seeing, oh, there's a bunch of more senior engineers like load balance on these kind of projects, but maybe we need to spread them out. And so once you've built that up, you could end up with something like this. Uh, and so this is uh, like a pretty filled up one. And from here, I have a couple of tactics for making this easier to read. And so different ways you can do it is uh, you can group your roadmap either by work stream or you can group it by engineer. Uh, usually when I'm sharing this out for stakeholders like Yuki or Dylan, for example, I'll want to group it by work stream since that showcases how the team is investing their time in different initiatives. And so you can draw something like a connector line and label it with what that work stream is for. For example, maybe building out like big interior for interior design. Um, something else I like doing is I like color coding the blocks. And so it's really easy to visually see <laughs> that uh, alignment. Um, and then I also use connectors as a hack to mark out milestones. And so you can click on this connector line and just like draw out a line. Uh, let me just draw out a line really quick. 
And then if you double click on it or click enter, you can add text on it and say, you know, for example, milestone two. And then you can click on that box and easily drag it around. So it's in a place that's easy to read. Um, when you draw these lines, use a small tip as well. Uh, sometimes it overlays and, and goes on top of your route map. So you can do something like right click and send it to the back so that it doesn't distract uh, your overall route map. And so here I'll actually jump into an example of the Gantt chart we used uh, during the last couple of weeks of Fig Jam before the launch, uh, which was on April 21st. And so this is probably one of the more, like one of the easier Gantt charts to build because everything's kind of laddering up to the same like end date, whereas frequently, you know, many launches could be staggered. Um, but here I'll talk through like a couple of the things we did here. And so you can see that this is a week by week uh, timeline. And we did little things like annotate, you know, this is a four day week. Um, so we're kind of aware that, you know, people will have less, you know, engineering days to work on things. Uh, we group things by core projects and core areas. And we use these like little mini blocks and slides to remind us of like the projects that kind of fall into that area. Uh, so for example, like, Part of how Figma and FigJam works together is we have to figure out a lot of the canvas interactions, the kind of the edge cases uh, that, that has to do with when you move like connectors, et cetera, into Figma. Um, you can also see here that we use things like the milestones to mark things out. Um, and actually, it was in visualizing this roadmap that we realized that you know, it probably would be helpful, helpful to have some buffer before the launch so that we can fix issues so that the launch goes really smoothly. And so you can also use things like this like huge horizontal block. Um, we've used that before to showcase things like uh, you know, quality weeks that might take the entire team, et cetera. Um, and one small tip that we've actually used for this roadmap is we actually brought over a translucent black box from Figma. And as time was going on, we would actually drag this out. So as like a way to motivate us and show that we're moving closer and closer to the deadline until we hit it. And I guess the final thing I'll show is that once you build out these roadmaps, uh, you can actually embed them into you know, whatever document or et cetera that might be helpful. So for example, I can click on this, grab the link, and maybe jump into a PRD. Like let's imagine that was a Gantt chart for the complicated project. Um, I could drop it in so that other people, when they're going through uh, you know, the product requirements doc, they can actually see the timeline and understand like what is happening when. And so that's the download on how uh, we use like Gantt charts to visualize work mapping. Thanks, uh, back to you, Anna. Great. Thank you so much for that, Emily. Um, yeah, something that is super great about Figma and FigJam is being able to actually embed um, elements from you know, either your Figma or FigJam files into any other kind of documentation that you have. I know I found it particularly useful to do that, especially when you're just showing um, you know, quick visuals of like the progress of, you know, decisions or any kind of brainstorm sessions that your team made together. Uh, yeah, so looks like um, Yuki's back in, got his internet to work again. Um, probably want to leave, you know, maybe 10 minutes for Q&A, but um, I think that definitely leaves plenty of time. Maybe Yuki, you could start off at talking about um, diving into some examples. Um, I think we have enough time to do that. Yeah. Okay, um, I can just really quickly finish uh, what I was saying, I think, which is that, um, you know, for retros, we talked about kind of the start, start, stop, continue framework, which I think is really nice, but sometimes it doesn't quite get at what you really want to ask about. So for the PM retro, team retro, I actually just had these really targeted questions, like, as a PM team, do we feel we're building the right things, executing the best way possible? Um, effectively, efficiently making decisions, working well with other functions, have a good culture and kind of like simplified it down to like what's going well and then what are things that we need, needs improvement, whether it's starting and stopping. And this is just kind of getting at that principle of like making sure that the reflection is deep enough to yield meaningful insights where it maybe felt a little bit too broad to say as the PM team, what can we start, stop, continue, and rather kind of like designate certain themes. So that's just like the only one 
uh, some uh, thing that I wanted to share. And um, you know, we found these quite particular questions to be pretty helpful in prompting the right kind of decisions, a discussion. So just wanted to share that um, at the very end. Um, and maybe uh, Anna, we can kind of go over to Q and A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, please uh, type them into the q and I'm going to be going through them and we'll be all answering all of these live right now. So I think uh, one great question that someone asked earlier was how many people and participants do you recommend having in these activities? What have you found works best and is the most productive? I can also take this answer. Um, I feel like, well, we, we support having um, a large number of people in your Fig Jam files. Uh, when Megan and I did a live stream, we had 200 people inside a Fig Jam file uh, doing illustrations together. So it really just, you know, it accommodates as many people as you need for a jam session. Um, I definitely think that, you know, using templates um, helps keep it more organized, especially when you have more people and also using the timer to help structure your session. So making sure that you've allocated enough time for people to brainstorm and also to go over any kinds of like ideas that people within your team have come up with. Um, so it's pretty open ended. I don't have any like you know, specific like best practices as in this is exactly what you should be doing, depending on the number of people in your team. Um, but yeah, when I do hold like any kinds of like brainstorm sessions over Fig Jam, um, I feel like just making sure that, you know, you're, if you have a large number of people breaking it up into small enough teams where everyone can, you know, express their ideas and opinions. Um, and then maybe from there, like just having each group kind of like present to the wider team, you know, what are like the common themes or ideas that came up as they were talking to each other. So I don't know if anyone has anything else to add, but otherwise um, I can go on to another question. Um, maybe you hear Emily, you guys can answer this one, but someone was asking about how, um, when we were launching Fig Jam, how did we decide to differentiate it from other existing whiteboarding solutions? Emily, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, is this the one that also comments on the fun or is this a different question? It's sort of like a combination between two. Someone mentioned specifically Miro, but then another one was asking about just like whiteboarding in general. Oh, got it. Okay, yeah, I can definitely talk about a little bit and also talk about like the, the fun angle. Um, but definitely at the core, when we were working on FigJam, we really wanted to solve the need that Yuki had pointed out that we were seeing from our Figma users. And so, and our Figma users are people who are members of the product team. And so I would say we really focused on like the product team needs as opposed to working on like a very, very general whiteboard solution. Um, and then one thing that I think that really differenti differentiates FigJam is actually a pretty fun story in that uh, we actually built out FigJam and we had a lot of features and we were actually dog fooding it internally and using it a lot. Uh, but we really felt like something was missing while we were using it. And this was in a period of time before we had a couple of features like cursor chat, emoting and stamping, uh, which actually maybe will make sense for me to demo. Um, but oh, as we were reflecting on what might be missing, we really thought about like what made Figma great and why did we start gravitating towards Figma for things like brainstorming and team icebreakers even before we built FigJam? And we realized it's because Figma has a lot of these small moments that like really delight you and make you feel connected with your coworkers. And so there's little things like if you drop into a file and you see someone else there, you can use something, you can you'll like wave your cursor aggressively at them, or maybe you'll start having a conversation with someone by like typing text and responding to people with text boxes and you have this like cascading tree of text that's kind of trailing off your page. Uh, and we really wanted to bring some of those moments to Big Jam so that you can connect with your coworkers. Uh, and I think Kelsey said something earlier about like making like a safe and friendly space for people to ideate together and really fostering that kind of like friendly team collaborative environment. Uh, and so, 
uh, we added these features that like we think really differentiate Big Jam against other teams that really make Big Jam more delightful. And so yeah, maybe actually, should I demo some of these features? Would that be helpful? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think also what you're saying ties in a lot to another question someone's asking as well. So if you can like kind of talk to both, but another person was wondering, you know, how do you connect Fig Jam with Figma design? Um, maybe like talk a bit more about that too. Yeah, yeah, I can show all of that. And so let me share my screen. And so actually maybe I'll also invite some people to join this file with me. Uh, but here's one feature, which is the cursor chat feature. And so if you right click, you can choose cursor chat or you can use this backslash and then you can actually talk with people like this. Uh, and we actually find that this is really helpful, for example, in our PM team meetings that first of all went over when people are going over their updates, we'll actually kind of like talk at them and say like, oh, that's cool, like hard problem, that kind of thing. Um, and it really helps give feedback to the presenter when they're going over something, which is really fun. Um, you can also right click and choose a moat or stamp. These are actually two sides of the same wheel. One lets you react to people in real time like this. And then the other one lets you do things like dot voting. And so all of these things kind of tied together really make Fig Jam like a, a little bit more delightful to be in. Um, the second question was about how Figma and Fig Jam are connected. And so this is actually something that we're thinking a lot about right now. Uh, right now, there are two ways that the two different types of files can work together. Uh, the first is that the design systems that uh, designers and more create are actually deeply integrated into Fig Jam and are accessible from here as well. Um, we also have a bunch of these default ones that we've built in uh, that, you know, that's where a lot of our stickers were coming from, from what you can see earlier. But if you click on this plus, you can actually find all of the libraries that are in your team. And so we have, you know, these like demo libraries and illustration libraries and our support team has a bunch of libraries, but you can actually add them on and use them in your Figma file as well, which is useful for things like wireframing. Um, the other thing is that you can actually move the things that you create between Figma and FigJam really easily. And so if I go back to my files here, oh, I'm in the wrong one. Um, so maybe I go here. Um, I can grab this file and go into Fig Jam and I can drop it in and I can, can continue to make tweaks. Uh, and vice versa, I can grab this one and I can bring that back into Figma as well. And so that's how Figma and Fig Jam are better connected. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for diving into that uh, and showing how it works. Uh, okay, so another example somebody had was, a. Um, I think, Kelsey, this is a question for you because it talks about brainstorming. So do you have any tips on running brainstorming workshops with the participants, um, maybe who aren't very comfortable with using online tools? Yeah, sure. Um, let me um, share my screen as well. Cool. So... I guess the first thing I'd say is depending on their appetite to try to learn a new tool, I do think that um, Emily and team have done a really good job of making this tool set really approachable. And so if people are open to it, you might um, see if you could spend the first five minutes teaching people. Oftentimes the legwork in this process comes with setting up the template. So someone who's familiar with the jam can get everything set up. And then once it is, um, it can be a lot less intimidating if you just show people like um, here is the stamp tool. You just select your face and drop it here and then pull out a post-it note and then start typing. Um, and so uh, for a lot of people that might be you know, helpful to just go through that and see if they're comfortable. Um, but some folks won't want to um, do something online 
either way. <laughs> um, and so I actually think it would be possible to run something where some people are doing it um, in a physical way. And so if you are planning a really big um, meeting, I do think you could either put some post-it notes in a conference room or send them to their homes in advance. And I think that the thing there is that you, you would want to make sure as you're facilitating the um, conversation afterwards to pause, ask for people to chime in with what they wrote down for each section um, and, and give them space to respond in person. Um, so I think it's possible, but I also just think that they've done such a good job with this product and, and making it just a few clicks um, after explaining it, you can also spend a couple of minutes just having people practice doing it, have a couple of minutes to answer questions and make it like a really um, comfortable space for people to learn for five to 10 minutes if you have the time to do that. So that's my answer there. I don't know if anyone else has any other suggestions. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Uh, we have a couple other questions where people are asking about organizing their files. So I don't know if anyone has any insights they want to share regarding, you know, how do you organize your FigJam files, especially when you have, you know, documentations living in like Coda or Dropbox paper. Do you guys have any specific recommendations on, you know, where specific documentation lives for a team when you want to embed, you know, a brainstorm session from FigJam? into something like Coda or Dropbox paper. Do you guys have any thoughts related to that you want to share? I can share a little bit on it. So um, at least for the PM team, you know, we have a PM team project, which is basically kind of like a folder essentially that keeps track of all the weekly meetings that we've had. And that just gives us an archive of things to get back to. So that's kind of like one very basic way in which organization can happen. Um, but to your point, Anna, um, and oftentimes what we see is people wanting to kind of like take this, maybe what is a one-off brainstorm, but then embed it in another context where even more work is getting done. And whether that's kind of like a paper doc or a JIRA thing or, uh, or a SANA task, like those are uh, definitely ways in which people have done it. Um, I, you know, other ways include creating links between files. So maybe you have like a design file that you're iterating on, but you have kind of like a table of contents that kind of like links out to some of the earlier brainstorms as well. So, um, or some designers even just kind of like, if it's not something you're going to come back to, you can just copy paste that entire brainstorm into a page. So those are some ways. Um, I definitely think that we can be doing more here. So we're thinking through that because we've gotten a lot of feedback on it, but uh, for now, those are the, the tools that are available. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, and something else that I've seen teams doing as well is because you can uh, create hyperlinks in Figma design. So you can also link those out to FigJam files if you want to reference you know, any kind of brainstorms or ideas that you want to pull in from there into your Figma designs. Um, I think we just have time for one last question. It was someone asking about wireframing in FigJam. Um, and so one suggestion that I have is so there's a lot of like community files out there where people have wireframing elements you can use. So they're like, you know, screen templates, buttons, things like that. Uh, what I found really useful is actually using those and then importing that library into FigJam because you have all those components from Figma that you can actually pull into your FigJam file. Um, and those will actually retain their variance and their responsivity. So if you pull in any kinds of like wireframing components from there, you can actually do wireframe within FigJam and you can actually switch between different components. And they're also going to be um, editable. So if you have like a button, you can add text into it and it will actually responsively grow within FigJam as well. So that's a really useful solution and something um, that I've been doing personally in my projects. Um, yeah, so I think just to wrap things up, um, just a quick summary for you guys. Uh, so the live stream is recorded. Um, it will be up on our YouTube channel, but we'll also follow up with an email to share it with you guys. Uh, please check out any kind of future live streams that we have um, at digma.com slash events. We'd really appreciate it if you guys could join us in more live streams because these are a lot of fun for us. And it's also a great way for us to get feedback from you guys. Uh, and yeah, if you have any kinds of like suggestions or ideas, um, please contact us and reach out. 
Um, we really value um, any of your feedback and it's a really great opportunity to make sure that we're constantly building things that are really useful for you guys. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us during um, this live stream. Thank you to all the PMs that have joined us today and showing how they use Big Jam. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you at the next live stream. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Bye. Everyone.